Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. In this world, there could be a copy of yourself making different decisions and seeing places that somehow later manifest themselves in your dreams. For thousands of years, people have wondered about the meaning of dreams. Why do some people dream about future events? Why are some dreams full of hidden meaning? Can some of our dreams be glimpses of events taking place in an alternate reality? a parallel universe. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, weirdos. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode… A calm resident spirit suddenly begins making the children in one home sick. The most sensational murder in 1930 revolved around the mob in Chicago, but the murder victim wasn't a made man, it was a reporter from the Chicago Tribune. In 1961, Joan Risch vanished from her Massachusetts home, leaving behind two children, a distraught husband, and a kitchen streaked with blood. Imagine receiving an email from one of your closest friends talking about what happened just yesterday. But that friend who emailed you died several months ago. Pregnancy and the paranormal – are the two related? I'll share four accounts from pregnant women who might have you believing there is a connection. Why do some people dream about future events? Why are some dreams full of hidden meaning? Can some of our dreams be glimpses of events taking place in an alternate reality, a parallel universe? We'll begin with that story. And later, a very creepy original story suggested to me by a fellow Weirdo family member called Happy Sun Daycare. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. In this world, there could be a copy of yourself making different decisions and seeing places that somehow later manifest themselves in your dreams. For thousands of years, people have wondered about the meaning of dreams. Why do some people dream about future events? Why are some dreams full of hidden meaning? Can some of our dreams be glimpses of events taking place in an alternate reality, a parallel universe? Our ancestors were as curious about dreams as modern scientists are today. Ancient Greeks and Romans believed dreams provided messages from the gods. In ancient China, people treated dreams as a way to visit the world of the dead. Ancient Egyptians were convinced that those who could interpret dreams possessed special powers. Many Native American tribes and Mexican civilizations believed dreams were a different world we visit when we sleep. The word dream comes from an old word in English that means joy and music. Today we know that dreams are often expressions of thoughts, feelings, and events that pass through our mind while we are sleeping. Dreams can be in color and include all the senses – smells, sounds, sights, tastes, and things we touch. We know more about the science of dreaming because researchers 
can take pictures of people's brains while they're sleeping. Over the years, scientists have learned a lot about dreams, but there are still many things that remain unknown. We will elaborate more on the subject and raise the idea that some of our most mysterious and special dreams could be glimpses from invisible parallel worlds that exist next to our own reality. For almost a hundred years, science has been haunted by a dark secret that there might be mysterious hidden worlds beyond our human senses. Mystics had long claimed that there were such places. They were, they said, full of ghosts and spirits. The last thing science wanted was to be associated with such superstition. But ever since the 1920s, physicists have been trying to make sense of an uncomfortable discovery. When they tried to pinpoint the exact location of atomic particles like electrons, they found it was utterly impossible. They had no single location, and this is one of the reasons why scientists are becoming more and more interested in the possible existence of parallel worlds. The only explanation which anyone could come up with is that the particles don't just exist in our universe. They flit into existence in other universes too, and there are an infinite number of these parallel universes, all of them slightly different. In effect, there is a parallel universe in which Napoleon won the Battle of Waterloo. In another, the British Empire held on to its American colony. In one, you were never born. The multiverse is a theory in which our universe is not the only one but states that many universes exist parallel to each other. These distinct universes within the multiverse theory are called parallel universes. Of course, the multiverse theory is just a theory. The existence of parallel universes has not been proven, and the subject is widely debated among physicists. By this very definition of universe, one might expect the notion of a multiverse to be forever in the domain of metaphysics. Yet the borderline between physics and metaphysics is defined by whether a theory is experimentally testable, not by whether it is weird or involves unobservable entities. The frontiers of physics have gradually expanded to incorporate ever more abstract and once metaphysical concepts such as a round earth, invisible electromagnetic fields, time slowdown at high speeds, quantum superpositions, curved space, and black holes. Over the past several years, the concept of a multiverse has joined this list," said Max Tegmark, professor of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. The fundamental problem of cosmology is that the laws of physics as we know them break down at the instant of the Big Bang. Well, some people say, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with having the laws of physics collapse? Well, for a physicist, this is a disaster. All our lives we've dedicated to the proposition that the universe obeys knowable laws, laws that can be written down in the language of mathematics, and here we have the centerpiece of the universe itself, a missing piece beyond physical law," says Dr. Michu Kaku. In a parallel world, there could be a copy of yourself. The life of this person has been identical to yours in every respect. Still, there are certain things you and your copy might do different. Perhaps he or she now decides to stop listening to this podcast without finishing it while you continue on. Your timelines are similar but not identical because you coexist in alternate worlds. People often have a recurring dream about a place they never visited or even heard of. Perhaps such dreams are glimpses from what one experienced in a parallel universe. Sometimes people dream about events that have not yet happened but will take place in the future. Such dreams could also be incoming images from an alternate world where you are living a different life. Who knows, perhaps some of our most special dreams are a window into a parallel universe. This is, of course, pure speculation. But without speculation and scientific curiosity, we will never be able to learn more about the secrets of the universe and our reality. Professor Tegmark once said, When we ask a profound question about the nature of reality, do we not expect an answer that sounds strange? 
so whenever we venture beyond the everyday world, we should expect it to seem bizarre. Do you keep a journal or a diary? If not, maybe you should consider it. It's been shown that journaling can help you reduce stress, help relieve depression, builds self-confidence, it boosts your emotional intelligence, helps with achieving goals, inspires creativity, and more. In fact, my friend S. Ann Lanise has created a Weird Darkness-themed journal just for you, full of blank pages for you to use as a diary, make notes for class or office meetings, jot down ideas for that novel you want to write, use it for keeping a mileage log if you travel for business, whatever you want. In fact, she has numerous styles of journals to choose from. Along with the Weird Darkness journal, there's one for dealing with grief, for teacher's notes, for medical residencies, keeping track of your meds or health routine, and several others. Journals make a great gift for others, but it's also a great gift for yourself and your own mental health. No matter what you might want a journal for, my friend Anne has it, and you can see all of her journals, including the one for Weird Darkness, on the Sponsors and Friends page at WeirdDarkness.com. I have a resident spirit in my home. It's a friendly one. We have an understanding, I suppose. But as of lately, I've noticed in quite a few incidents that this one tends to warn me of things to come. On one occasion, during the flu and head and chest cold outbreak in my children's schools, with no sign of them being remotely sick, the activity started up. From the sound and vibration of my downstairs patio door sliding open – never did it actually open – I can feel the vibration of it opening and closing because my bedroom is right above the dining room which leads out to the back patio. Then hearing those all-too-familiar footsteps walking the length of the hallway and into my bedroom across the floor at the end of my bed and suddenly stop. Hearing the same footsteps going down my staircase, hearing the voices whispering, and again seeing the ever-fleeting shadow in my room and all around the house. When I noticed the activity, I hadn't yet figured out why it suddenly became more active. Then, within that same week, one by one, my kids started to come down with the flu. One would get better, then the next one would get sick, ending up in major bleaching and cleaning of the home. Sanitize, sanitize, sanitize. So I wrote it all down and put the activity journal away. Didn't think any more of it. Two months ago, I had this feeling of dread, and it wouldn't go away. I just kept feeling it. So I warned my husband to be careful while driving etc., etc. I honestly didn't know where it was coming from. I was on caution all the time while taking my pup out to use the bathroom, to watching and walking my kids to the bus stops in the mornings, to making sure all the locks on windows and doors were locked at night. Then I, for whatever reason, I started thinking of his cousin. Now, we hadn't really spoken to him in a while, but memories kept popping in. His face, his house continued to creep into my thoughts. One Saturday evening, after his cousin had attended a funeral, he had headed home and made it there but then decided to leave in his car. My husband and I decided to grab a bite to eat after I finally got off work. We got home and we started talking about this particular cousin out of nowhere. I had this sinking yet calm feeling in the pit of my stomach. Interrupting our conversation, he gets a call from his uncle. He answers it, and the news he got was extremely saddening and unexpected. His cousin had been shot and was at the hospital. I instantly got chills over my chest area and pictures like a movie of it happening. I told my husband he's been shot in his chest and he's not going to live. He said, yeah, I don't know yet. They don't know where he's been shot uh, or what happened. The next evening, after many calls, texts, and updates on social media, his cousin was pronounced dead. His uncle was at the hospital. My husband just couldn't go up there, and he called to let him know he'd been shot in his chest by a neighbor. The week before all this took place, activity started to happen. My TV would switch channels to something that had to do with that particular city in which his cousin lived, thus causing some memories to pop in. 
And now for the last set of activities I will include here. Activity started up two weeks ago. Footsteps, patio doors, sounds and vibrations, and what sounded like my puppy's footsteps running into my room and around my bed. I immediately sit up and look around. No sight of him. So I get up, thinking maybe he had run into one of the other bedrooms. Finding nothing, I head downstairs. I walk into the dining room to find him fast asleep, snoring. At one point, while laying in bed, I heard a voice shout my name. I opened my eyes, looked around, hubby fast asleep, and all is still pitch black. No lights to indicate the kids were up, and no, they don't call me by my name. But I had to investigate. I couldn't lay back down not knowing all was secure. Again, found nothing. Then for the last part, which led up to the warning, I felt someone poke my shoulder while laying down. Felt like one finger poked me. Felt my cover being pulled down over my feet three times before I asked it to stop. Then what sounded like my little TV being moved ever so slightly on my stand a couple of times. The next morning, I started to feel nauseous and my stomach started to cramp up a bit. Not sure where it came from. Just as soon as it started, it ended as well. So I went about my day. The next morning, I discovered my poor pup covered in his own watery feces and vomit from being stuck in his cage at night and coming down with a serious stomach virus. We took him to the vet and they gave us instructions to keep him hydrated with a few options. Over the past week, I have been nursing him back to his good health and I'm so happy to say that he is back to his normal self. For literally thousands of years, the human race has asked if there is such a thing as an afterlife. Plenty of stories abound with regards to visions of heaven or hell or meeting with long-departed ancestors or relatives, messages from murder victims with details of the crime that took their life. One of the most convincing examples of possible messages from the afterlife is the story of Pennsylvanian Jack Fries. In June 2011, Fries suffered a fatal arrhythmia that left all of his friends and family devastated by his passing. He was just 32 years of age. Five months on, and the grieving process was beginning to settle down when it was suddenly regenerated by a series of emails sent from Fries's email account. Tim Hart considered himself to be among Fries's closest friends and was the target of one of the first emails to be sent, titled, I'm Watching. This email outlined a conversation the pair shared several months before Fries's sudden passing. The short email read as follows, Did you hear me? I'm at your house. Clean your effing attic. Hart did admit to feeling concerned when he initially read the email. He almost felt the color drain from his cheeks. During an interview conducted by the BBC, he also revealed that he replied to it but never got an answer back. Hark firmly believes that there was very little chance that anyone outside of the pair would know of the private conversations between the best friends. It would appear unlikely that neither would really share the experience to a third or even fourth party. Tim Hart was not alone in receiving an email from Freese. Jimmy McGraw was Freese's cousin and was also a recipient of an email from the same account. This time, the message was even stranger and potentially more unsettling. After Freeze's death, McGraw suffered a broken ankle that became the basis of this email message. This time, the message read, Hey Jim, how you doing? I knew you were going to break your ankle. Tried to warn you, gotta be careful. While Tim Hart was less than enthused with the email he received, Jimmy was much more so. Far from considering it as a kind of ill omen, McGraw took it in a much more positive manner. He wanted to believe that his cousin was still keeping an eye open on his behalf, but concedes that the chances that Freese sent the email were slim. 
McGraw felt like he was being coerced into moving on with his life. On the whole, it looks like a sincere message and nothing like the banter that was sent previously. The big question is who is sending these emails? None of Reese's friends believed that anyone other than Jack knew the password to his email account, and there were no signs of the account being hacked. There is one logical answer, and that is a service known as Dead Man's Switch. This site allows users to send emails on a regular basis after death occurs. These emails, sent at regular intervals which could range from 30 to 52 days, are automatically sent to predetermined email addresses. There are problems with this possible solution, though. Nobody knows for certain whether or not Freese actually signed up for this service. His death was a sudden one, and chances are that Freese did not anticipate it and cater for his passing. Even if he did, then he would have had to have written them himself, but how could he have possibly known that weeks after his unforeseen passing that his own cousin would break his ankle? Are these really messages? from beyond the grave? Pregnancy and the Paranormal are the two related? While on the surface the two topics couldn't seem more different, many people believe that pregnant women attract attention from the other side. Some theorize this happens because the unborn are in a transitional phase and have an otherworldly guardian. Could there be truth to these theories? Here are a few creepy tales I have gathered from pregnancy forums and discussion boards. What do you make of the stories? Sounds in the Night Not trying to sound crazy, but since I've become pregnant, my cats have gone nuts and both my husband and I have been hearing strange noises in our home. Last night it scared the hell out of us. We were both in bed sleeping. At around 3.40 a.m. we heard a loud, high-pitched whining noise coming from the living room. We had a fan on at the foot of our bed to help me breathe and cool off, but we could hear the sound loud and clear over the fan. We both shot up in bed and looked around. Both of our cats were awake and in bed with us and their ears were perked, but neither of them moved. My husband was spooked and went investigating around the house, but found nothing. I was too scared to leave the room. We have no appliances or cell phones or anything that could make a noise like that. We've lived here five years and have never had any occurrences until I became pregnant. What's going on? bumps in the night. I never really experienced anything with my first pregnancy, but during my second my husband and I would hear all kinds of noises, like toys going off, the TV turning on and off, footsteps on the stairs, etc. It all stopped a couple of months after I had my daughter. Now I'm pregnant with my third and had forgotten all about that stuff until lately. My husband had to leave for the week, so me and the kids were home alone. I had no problem with it until two nights ago. I received a phone call at 2.30 a.m. and it woke me up. I soon heard Tupperware being thrown around the kitchen, then footsteps coming up the stairs. I started to get scared and I didn't want to see anything so I closed my eyes and laid down and heard the footsteps come into my room and walk around the bed. I was so terrified I called my husband and he called me down enough so I could get up and go pee. Tonight, we came home around 8.30 and I saw all my lights and TVs were on. I always turn everything off and my curtains were all closed. I left them open. So I took a pic to send to my husband, but white things appeared all over the picture. Then we went up to bed and every dresser drawer was pulled out as far as they could go. I'm just ready for my husband to come home. Oh, and when I went to the restroom last night, I saw a man's shadow standing against the wall in the dining room. At first I thought it was something making the shadow, but I looked around and couldn't see anything that could do it. And then the shadow was gone. There has to be some kind of connection with pregnancy 
and paranormal activity. Mama's Boy When I was pregnant with my second son, we were living in Fort Hood, Texas. I lived next to a fellow Army family with a four-month-old son, and one day the husband came home to find his wife not breathing. He called 911, but she passed away a few days later. During the time she slowly died, I watched the couple's baby while the father was at the hospital. Weird things would happen, but I didn't think much of it yet because the mother was still alive and it didn't even cross my mind that it could be her. A couple of days after she died, I was keeping the baby overnight as his dad was having a really hard time. That night, so many weird things happened. I had the baby asleep in a crib and that was already set up for my son who I was still pregnant with because I had nowhere else for him to sleep safely. Later on, I heard him cry on the monitor and when I woke to get him, he was literally fast asleep. No whimpers, nothing. When I laid back down, the little bears on a mobile attachment to a bassinet in my room started to move round and round and I felt her watching me. I tried to go back to sleep but couldn't because I kept hearing stuff on the monitor, either the baby crying or a woman whispering or the mobile swinging. About an hour later, the baby did wake up, and I sat in the glider next to the crib in my son's soon-to-be nursery. I seriously felt her watching me again. It was the weirdest thing, and I swear it's like she was making sure I did what she would have done. I couldn't help it. I just started to cry. Not only were my prego hormones going crazy, but I was holding a baby who had just lost his mama. He ate and fell back asleep, and I placed him back in the crib and returned to my room. Again, the bears started swinging. Needless to say, the weirdness of the night kept coming. I finally went and just picked the baby up and held him for the rest of the night. Nothing else happened. I still think that's what she wanted all along. She wanted me to hold him. Shadow People I'm eight months pregnant, and lately I've been seeing what some describe as shadow people in my home. About a month or two ago, I began noticing shadowy movement just out of range of sight. The perceived movement is always very brief, a second or two at most, and always vanishes the instant I look up. I can't really say if the shadows are humanoid though on a couple of occasions I thought I saw my toddler daughter walking in the hallway or my husband returning from the bathroom when they were actually in a different part of the house. I also saw a distinct flash in the kitchen, though I dismissed it as lightning or sunlight bouncing off a metallic object outside. Last night I mentioned the sightings to my husband, who I fully expected to tease me. However, he has seen them too. I hope we're just imagining things. Are you a member of the Darkness Syndicate? The Darkness Syndicate is a private membership where you receive commercial-free episodes of the Weird Darkness podcast and radio show, behind-the-scenes video updates about future projects and events I'm working on, you can share your own opinions on ideas to help me decide upon Weird Darkness contests and events. You can hear audiobooks I'm narrating before even the publishers or authors get to hear them. You also receive bonus audio of other projects I'm working on outside of Weird Darkness. You get all of these benefits and more starting at only $5 per month. Join the Weird Darkness Syndicate at WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. On April 2, 1931, a small-time thug named Leo Brothers was sentenced to spend 14 years in prison for one of the most spectacular murders in Chicago gangland history. In this case, it was not an infamous mobster that was gunned down, but an ordinary reporter for the Chicago Tribune 
named Jack Lingle. But was he really an ordinary reporter? In the wake of his death, most don't think so. For Chicagoans who lived through the turbulent days of the beer wars in the city, crime, murder, and violence became commonplace. But on Monday, June 9, a new and apparently different incident became the talk of the town. It was an outrage that was splashed across the front page of every newspaper in the city. This was the murder of Alfred L. Jake Lingle, a crime reporter for the Chicago Tribune who was shot to death while walking, smoking a cigar, and reading the racing news in the crowded underpass at Randolph Street and Michigan Boulevard during the lunch hour. It would become the most sensational murder of 1930, even though prior to his death the general public had no idea who Lingle was. In spite of this, his murder created a furor. In those days, newspaper reporters were not well paid, but they had a place in public regard that was generated by glamour, respect, and authority. The murder of Lingle immediately assumed the importance of that of a public official and was publicized by every newspaper in town. Lingle's duties on the police beat for the Tribune earned him $65 a week, which was not a princely sum. He had no aptitude for writing and could only transmit the facts. For 18 years, he had been a legman who gathered crime news and phoned it in to the city editor's desk. For writers at the Tribune, he was a great asset. Crime was front-page news in the Chicago of the 1920s, and every paper relied heavily on its in-house crime expert. In that category, Lingle had no equal. He frequently scooped the competition, for not only did he enjoy easy access to Capone, he was on intimate terms with both Police Commissioner Russell and Deputy Commissioner Steg. Lingle never had a byline in the paper and his name was unknown to most readers. To the public, he became much more famous in death than he ever was in life. And soon, he became notorious as details about his lifestyle began to be revealed. The supposedly humble reporter owned a chauffeur-driven Lincoln limousine and had just bought a $16,000 house at Long Beach on Lake Michigan, where his wife and two children were planning to spend the summer months. He also owned a house on the west side but had recently taken a suite at the Stevens, one of Chicago's most stylish hotels. He was an avid gambler at the horse and greyhound tracks, but his lavish way of life couldn't be bought with winnings at the track. On the day of his death, Lingle was on his way to the races. He had left his wife packing for her departure to the lake house and he planned to spend the afternoon at Washington Park in Homewood. Later that night, he planned to go to the Sheridan Wave Tournament Club, a society gambling parlor on Waveland Avenue where the champagne, whiskey, and food were distributed with the management's compliments during play. It was due to reopen that evening and Lingle wanted to be there. In retrospect, it seems that Lingle knew he was in trouble. Attorney Louis B. Paquette later volunteered to the police that 24 hours before Lingle's death, he had met with the reporter in the loop. They stood on Randolph Street talking about the discovery of a murder victim named Red McLaughlin, whose body had been found in the canal. Lingle was given Paquette his theory about the crime when a blue sedan with two men in it pulled alongside them and stopped at the curb. Lingle stopped talking in mid-sentence and looked at the men in a startled way. The two men simply stared at him. Lingle never finished what he was saying to Paquette. He simply told the attorney goodbye and walked into a nearby store. Also, on the day of his murder, after lunching at the Sherman Hotel, he met Sergeant Thomas Alcock of the Detective Bureau and told him that he was being tailed. And apparently he was. After buying cigars at the Sherman Hotel kiosk, he walked the four blocks to Michigan Avenue to catch the 1.30 p.m. train to the Washington Park racetrack. He descended into the underground walkway that led to the Illinois Central Suburban Electric Railroad in Grant Park. At that time of day, the subway was very crowded, filled with a steady stream of shoppers and office workers. Oddly, though, even though he knew he was being followed, Lingle acted unconcerned. According to witnesses, he arrived at the entrance to the subway walking between two men, 
One had blonde hair and wore a straw boater hat and a gray suit. The other was dark-haired and wore a blue suit. At the entrance, Lingle paused and bought a racing edition of the evening newspaper. As he did so, a man in a roadster on the south side of Randolph Street blew his horn to attract Lingle's attention. There were two men in the automobile, and one of them called out, Play High Schneider in the third! According to a yellow cab superintendent who heard the exchange, Lingle grinned, waved at the man, and called back, I've got him! Lingle walked on into the subway, where he was seen by Dr. Joseph Springer, a former coroner's physician and a longtime acquaintance. Springer later reported, Lingle didn't see me, he was reading the race information. He was holding it before him with both hands and smoking a cigar. Lingle had almost reached the end of the subway. He stopped across from the newsstand, about 25 feet short of the east exit, and the dark man who'd been walking next to him moved away as if to buy a paper. As he did, the blonde man stepped behind Lingle, pulled out a snub-nosed 38 Colt, and fired a single shot into the back of Lingle's head. The single bullet drove upward into his brain and exited his forehead. Lingle pitched forward, cigar still clenched in his teeth and newspaper still in his hands. The blonde killer tossed away the gun and ran forward into the crowds. Then, for some reason, he doubled back past Lingle's body and ran up the eastern staircase. He jumped a fence, changed his mind again, ran west on Randolph Street, through a passage where he tossed away a left-hand silk glove, probably used to prevent leaving fingerprints, and pursued by a policeman ran on to Wabash Avenue where he disappeared into the crowd. Meanwhile, in the subway, a bystander named Patrick Campbell saw the dark-haired man who had been walking with Lingle and the killer hurrying towards the west exit. He moved to try and catch him, but his movement was blocked by a priest who bumped into him. The priest delayed Campbell just long enough for the accomplice to escape. He told Campbell that he was getting out of the subway because someone had been shot. Later, Lt. William Cusack of the Detective Bureau commented gruffly, he was no priest, a priest would never do that, he would have gone to the side of the stricken person. Slowly, the method of Lingle's murder became clear. He had walked into a trap that had been formed by perhaps as many as a dozen men. But what was never put forward as a theory, and which seems the most likely explanation, was that during his progress into the subway between the two men, he was eased along at gunpoint, under orders to keep walking naturally and keep reading the paper. That evening, Colonel Robert R. McCormick, publisher of the Chicago Tribune, summoned his news staff together and addressed them about the death of a reporter that he had never met and whose name he had likely never heard before. He spoke for 45 minutes and pledged to solve the murder of the martyred journalist. The next morning, the front page of the paper blared with an eight-inch banner headline that announced the death of Lingle. The story read, Alfred L. Lingle, better known in the world of newspaper as Jack Lingle and for the last 18 years a reporter of the Tribune, was shot to death yesterday in the Illinois Central Subway at the east side of Michigan Avenue at Randolph Street. The Tribune offers $25,000 as a reward for information which will lead to the conviction of the slayer or slayers. An additional reward of $5,000 was announced by the Chicago Evening Post, making a total of $30,000. The next morning, not to be outdone by the Tribune, Hearst's Chicago Herald and Examiner also offered up a $25,000 reward, bringing the total up to $55,000. Colonel McCormick, meanwhile, continued to take Lingle's death as an affront to him personally and an attack on the press. He regarded it as being much more serious than the other hundreds of cases of violence that plagued Chicago. He announced that Lingle's murder was committed in reprisal and as an attempt to intimidate the newspapers into suppressing stories about the dealings of the underworld. But, he declared, this was now a war, and the Tribune and Chicago's other newspapers would not rest until Lingle's killers had been brought to justice. What was especially shocking was that up to that point, gangsters had taken a hands-off policy towards harming reporters. Lingle was hailed as a hero who died in the service of the public, and over 25,000 people attended his funeral. Police Commissioner Russell was forced into making a statement. I have given orders to the five deputy police commissioners to make this town so quiet 
that you'll be able to hear a consumptive canary cough, he said colorfully, but then added as a preliminary explanation for the lack of further action, of course, most of the underworld has scuttled off to hiding places. It will be hard to find them, but we will never rest until the criminals are caught and Chicago is free of them forever. The next day, a newspaper editorial remarked sadly, These gangs have run the town for many months and have strewn the streets with the lacerated bodies of their victims. Commissioner Russell and Deputy Commissioner John P. Stegg have had their opportunity to break up these criminal gangs who have made the streets hideous with bleeding corpses. They have failed. Russell replied to the charges, My conscience is clear. All I ask is that the city will sit tight and see what is going to happen. All that actually happened was that Russell and Stegg, in the words of the newspaper, staged a mock heroic battle with crime by arresting every dirty-necked ragamuffin on the street corners but carefully abstained from taking into custody any of the men who matter. Meanwhile, some of the blanks that had remained in the accounts of Lingle's character and lifestyle began to be filled in. It's fair to say that the management at the Tribune was unaware of them, or they likely would not have turned Lingle into the martyr that they did. Some of the facts that had remained so far unmentioned were that he had himself hinted that he was the man who fixed the price of beer in Chicago, that he was a close friend of Al Capone and had stayed with him at his Florida estate, that when he died he was wearing a diamond-studded belt buckle that had been a gift from Capone, that he was on improbably friendly terms for a newspaper reporter of his lowly status with millionaire businessmen, judges, and county and city officials, and that he spent golfing holidays and shared stock market tips with the police commissioner, a boyhood chum whom Lingle had helped elevate to his current position in 1928. By the time a week had passed, certain reservations had started to temper the anger about the newspaper man's slaying that had been displayed on the front page and in the editorial columns of the Tribune. As more details about Lingle's extracurricular activities began to emerge, McCormick and his editorial executives began to backpedal away from their earlier statements and demands. Rumors about Lingle's background and liaisons were racing around Chicago supported by muckraking stories in other newspapers, and the Tribune began to take a different stance. They admitted that Lingle was apparently involved in some unsavory activities, but they noted that the gangsters who killed him were still out there, and they still needed to be brought to justice. McCormick's investigators, as well as the police, had learned a lot about the background of Jake Lingle, a semi-professional baseball player from the slums who had wormed his way into the lowest levels of Chicago journalism. His first job after leaving a West Jackson Boulevard elementary school was as an office boy at a surgical supply house. He was playing semi-professional baseball at the time, and he met William Russell, at that time a police patrolman, with whom he struck up a friendship. Lingle was hired as a Tribune copy boy in 1918. He had no aptitude for writing, but it was his long list of contacts, mostly made through Russell and timely telephone calls to the city desk, that made him indispensable to editors and rewrite men. The brash and cocky reporter cultivated acquaintances in the courts, the jails, and in the gin mills of the north and south sides. Relying on the word of informants and friendships, he became one of the city's least known but cleverest crime reporters. He also became one of the wealthiest, but whether this was from his dealings in the stock market, his investments in gambling clubs on the north side, or from some other source is unknown. Some believed that Lingle operated as a liaison between the underworld and the city's political machine. Many out-of-town newspapers were referring to the slain reporter as the unofficial chief of police, who, for a sum, was able to put the fix in for gamblers bootleggers, and anyone else who was having a problem involving law enforcement. Among the City Hall insiders with whom he maintained a close relationship was attorney Samuel A. Edelson, the corporation counsel for Chicago and an operator in city government. Al Capone confirmed that Lingle was one of the boys during an interview in Florida in July 1930. He said that Lingle was a friend and that he didn't have any sort of disagreement with him that led to his death. Capone also stated, the Chicago police know who killed him. 
the question of who killed Jake Lingle was temporarily forgotten during exposure of his fascinating financial affairs. In addition to the secret bank account that Lingle kept with the Lakeshore Trust and Savings Bank, he was also known for carrying large sums of cash in his pocket. He had $9,000 on him the day that he was killed. Another interesting branch of his activities that came to light were his loans from gamblers, politicians, and businessmen. He had borrowed $2,000 from Jimmy Mondi, a Capone gambling operator in Cicero and The Loop, a loan that had never been paid back. He had also borrowed $5,000 from Alderman Berthold A. Cronson, nephew of Samuel Edelson, who later stated that the loan was a pure friendship proposition. That loan, too, had never been repaid. He also had $5,000 from Edelson himself, who only said that he had never loaned money to Lingle but often gave him some small remembrance at Christmas. He had a loan of $2,500 from Carlos Ames, president of the Civil Service Commission that Ames stated was a purely personal affair. He had $300 from Police Lieutenant Thomas McFarland, who said that he had given Lingle the money because they had been close friends for many years. It was also alleged that Sam Hare, a roadhouse and gambling parlor operator, had loaned Lingle $20,000. Hare denied it. Investigations also revealed that Lingle had been in an investment partnership with his old friend William Russell. The account, used for stock market speculation, was opened in November 1928 with a $20,000 deposit. On September 20, 1929, preceding the market crash in October, their joint paper profits were $23,696. Later, a loss of $58,850 was shown. Lingle showed paper profits at a peak of $85,000 that, after the crash, were converted to a loss of $75,000. Russell's losses were variously reported as $100,000 and $250,000. As to the source of the money put up by Lingle and deposited by him into his bank account, investigators noted, we have thus far been able to come to no conclusion. But the press and the public had come to conclusions, and they were painfully obvious ones, which again confirmed that they were the residents of a city that was governed by dishonorable leaders and corrupt officials. The newspapers theorized about why Lingle had been murdered, but the fervor and righteous anger had waned. The unofficial verdict was that Lingle had asked for it, so to speak, by becoming involved with gangsters and dirty politicians. Most theories of his death identified Lingle as a favor seller and most placed the blame on Capone's opposition, the Moran Aiello merger. One story that made the rounds in Gangland was that Lingle had been given $50,000 to secure protection for a West Side dog track, that he had failed to do so, and kept the money. Another story implicated him in the reopening of the Sheridan Wave Tournament Club, which had been operated by the Weiss Moran Gang, but which, after the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, had closed. Moran worked for 18 months to try and find sympathetic officials to help him reopen the club, giving the job to Joe Josephs and Julian Potatoes Kaufman. It was said that Kaufman, an old friend of Lingle, had approached the reporter and asked him to use his influence with the police to get the club open again. Allegedly, Lingle agreed to do so, but only if he were cut in on the action. He demanded 50% of the profits, but Kaufman refused. Lingle then allegedly retorted, if this joint is opened up, you'll see more squad cars in front ready to raid it than you ever saw in your life before. In spite of this, the story said the club was permitted to reopen anyway. It was widely advertised that it would be opening on June 9, the day on which Lingle set out for the races for the final time. An equally plausible story stated that he got too deeply involved in the struggle for money and power in the gambling syndicate. For years, there had been a bitter war between the General News Bureau, a racing newswire service that existed entirely for the purposes of betting, and the independent news services. As an appointed intermediary, Lingle brought the two opposed factions together in January 1930 and a two-year truce was agreed upon. The truce, it was said, may not have extended to Lingle. Perhaps some of these stories were true, 
or perhaps all or none of them were true. Whatever the reason behind his murder, Lingle likely just got mixed up in the violence and bloodshed of gangland, an arena where even the most experienced can sometimes be torn apart. The biggest question remained, who pulled the trigger that ended the reporter's life? Weeks then months passed before the police produced a suspect. The serial number on the handgun that the killer had dropped had been filed off, but ballistics expert Colonel Calvin Goddard traced the origin of the gun to a sporting goods store owned by Peter von Francius on Diversey Parkway. Records showed that the gun had been sold to Frankie Foster, a member of the Northside Moran Gang. Foster fled to Los Angeles after the Lingle shooting but was indicted in Chicago as an accessory before the fact to murder. Foster, whose real name was Frank Citro, was eventually extradited to Chicago and was held in the county jail for four months before the evidence against him was deemed inconclusive and the charges against him were dropped. A short time later, a new suspect was named. Leo Vincent Brothers, a labor union slugger from St. Louis, was arrested in New York and indicted for the legal murder. Brothers had started out as a member of Egan's Rats and soon graduated into labor racketeering and contract murder. Dodging a 1929 murder indictment, Brothers fled to Chicago where he found work with Al Capone. Brothers was convicted and sentenced to 14 years in prison for killing Lingle on April 2, 1931. I can do that standing on my head, Brothers quipped after the sentence was handed down. Most observers, then and now, believe that Brothers was handed up to the state by Al Capone as a sacrifice, taking the fall for Jack Zuda, a racketeer who ran a string of whorehouses. Zuda was already dead by the time the trial wrapped up. It seemed that just about everyone had a motive to kill Jake Lingle, but crime historians are in general agreement that Brothers took the rap and served time for a substantial cash payoff, but we'll never really know for sure. After his release in 1940, Brothers returned to St. Louis, beat his original murder case, and became hooked up with the local mob. Three months after an abortive attempt on his life, Leo Brothers died of heart disease in St. Louis on December 23, 1950. He took the secrets of the Lingle murder with him to the grave. If you like what you're hearing on Weird Darkness, Please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. At approximately 4.30 p.m. on October 24, 1961, Sergeant Michael McHugh of the Lincoln, Massachusetts Police Department received a phone call. On the other end of the line was Barbara Barker, a woman living on Old Bedford Road. McHugh listened as Barker expressed concern about the well-being of her neighbor, Joan Risch. Barker explained that she had just been to the Risch home and found blood all over the kitchen floor. Joan, however, was nowhere in sight. McHugh hung up and arrived at the Cape Cod-style home in less than five minutes. He entered through the side door and found himself in the kitchen. The floor was smeared in blood. The table was overturned, and the handset of the wall-mounted telephone had been ripped from its cradle. It hung awkwardly on the edge of a small trash pail. McHugh first believed he was dealing with a suicide he searched the entire house for a body, but came up empty. He also walked the perimeter of the home looking for clues, 
but couldn't find a thing. Then McHugh telephoned the station and told them to pull the plug, which meant to send out the whole department for assistance in searching the surrounding woods. When the rest of the officers arrived, police chief Leo Algio encountered the neighbor who first called the authorities, Barbara Barker. Barker recalled how she had seen Joan outside around 2.30 p.m. that day, wearing a skirt, sweater, and a gray trench coat. Barker also remembered seeing Joan carrying something red but could not say what it was. She said Joan was level-headed and faithful, meaning that Joan would not have had any male company in her husband's absence. According to her statement, Barker had gone shopping and returned around 4.15 p.m. Shortly after, Joan's young daughter, Lillian, had run to Barker's home crying about not being able to find her mommy and about her baby brother being left in his crib unattended. Barker took Lillian and David to another neighbor's house across the street, inspected the Rish home, and called the police. Chief Algeo ordered a search of the local hospitals. After another sweep of the home, additional blood was found on the wall near the telephone, on the doorframe between the kitchen and dining room, and on the telephone box. Almost all of the blood had dried except for a few pooled spots on the floor. All signs pointed to a struggle. Strangely, the phone directory was open to a page that listed emergency numbers. Outside, the police also noticed some slight damage to the Rish car. The woods were searched with bloodhounds, without success. Police turned their attention to Joan's husband, Martin Rish, who'd been out of town for the day. He was summoned back to Lincoln and brought to the police barracks where police took his statement. Martin stated that he left his home at 6.50 a.m. on October 24th and had driven to Logan Airport for his flight to New York City. He explained his actions throughout the day, including phone calls he had made as well as the name of the hotel where he'd been staying until the police contacted him at 7 p.m. that evening. Martin Risch described his wife as a shy woman. He informed the police that her daily routine seldom changed and stressed the fact that she never left the children alone. When questioned about the contents of the trash pail on the kitchen floor, Martin could account for everything, except for the presence of empty beer bottles. The damage to the car, he recalled, was either from himself or Joan bumping off the garage doors. He did admit that his wife was often susceptible to the door-to-door solicitations of traveling salesmen. The only extracurricular activity she engaged in was with the Women's League of Voters. The following day, the FBI was notified of Joan Risch's disappearance. Six days later, the town of Lincoln offered a $500 reward for information on Joan's whereabouts. By November, there were still no answers. The FBI could not determine whether or not the amount of blood found in the Risch kitchen was substantial enough to indicate a murder. Additionally, the newspapers published reports that a suspicious man had been seen lurking near the home just before the incident, which the FBI dismissed as unfounded. The consensus was that Joan Risch had not been abducted or victimized, but that she had hemorrhaged. The blood type in the kitchen matched Joan's, or caused a self-inflicted wound, then left the home of her own accord. Information soon materialized that a dazed and bloody woman fitting Joan's description was seen running along Route 128 on the date of her disappearance. Police responded by dispatching divers to search the nearby reservoir. Departments in other states were notified, as were relatives in Connecticut, New York, Florida, and California. Nothing turned up. The daughter of the Rish's other neighbors, the Keens, claimed she saw a strange car on their street on the day of Joan's disappearance. Several leads on this mysterious car, which might have been blue, were explored, all with no success. The FBI continued to assist Massachusetts State Police whenever possible. But because there was no proof that Joan Risch was lying dead somewhere outside of Massachusetts, the FBI could not consider it a federal violation. Thus, its hands were tied, and agents could do little else than sit on the sidelines. On January 3, 1962, Boston's Record American newspaper offered a $5,000 reward to mobilize a public search for Joan Risch. The newspaper also ran several pages detailing an hour-by-hour retrace 
of Jones' activities on the afternoon of October 24, 1961. There were more details about the crime scene, the amount of blood, and the discovery of three distinct fingerprints, none of which could be traced to anyone, including, because of her absence, Joan. No further leads came, and the reward went unclaimed. There has never been a definitive explanation for the fate of Joan Risch. Independent investigators have theorized that Joan was murdered by an intruder and that her body was taken to Lexington, Massachusetts to be buried on a vacant patch of land that later became a subdivision named Springdale Estates. Some believe Joan staged her own disappearance when it was discovered that she had been checking out library books about disappearances immediately prior to her own. Others think Joan's disappearance might somehow have been related to her traumatic childhood. She was adopted after her parents died in what was reported as a suspicious house fire, and the Boston Globe reports that Joan may have been sexually abused as a young girl. It's likely we will never know what truly did happen to Joan Risch on that October day 55 years ago. The first letter seemed harmless enough, possibly even just the result of a mistaken delivery. The second one drew concern, and paired with the unexplained visions of something darkly unsettling, Sam Morris finally caves. The everyman safe world he lives in is about to take a drastic and dark turn. He quickly falls into a world of insanity, the morbid and the macabre he's drawn into a darkness that is just as deadly as it is mysterious. A darkness that dwells in a house that could only be conjured up by a mad brain. It is a house that calls you, a house that haunts you with its ghosts. They'll scratch and claw through your fragile hide, bringing madness bubbling to the surface. Come see the ghosts for yourself. If you dare... Weird Darkness Publishing presents Of a Mad Brain by Scott Donnelly. Now available on paperback, ebook, and audiobook versions through Amazon and WeirdDarkness.com. Just a few miles outside of town stood an old country house. It had been converted into a daycare where parents would drop off their kids for the day and pick them up in the evening. However, said daycare had been out of business for a few years now. There was a sign posted in the front yard just a few feet from the house that read, Happy Sun Daycare, with a drawing of a cute little cartoony sun painted on it. In the fenced-in backyard stood playground equipment that had since fallen into disrepair and had begun to rust. A slide, a couple of swing sets, some monkey bars, and a merry-go-round were once covered by swarms of children as they ran and played in the outdoors. They had since become perches for the local birds and squirrels and were swarmed by ants rather than children. I had decided to write a report on the Happy Sun Daycare for the news blog I worked for. For one thing, several of the citizens today had gone to that daycare. I figured it might make for an interesting story to read about their experiences there and if it affected their later life in any way. The other reason wasn't quite so innocent. There had always been concerned parents who would fret over leaving their children in someone else's care. That constant worry over how safe their sons and daughters were, especially with all the horror stories posted online about various daycare-related tragedies. For my report, I decided I would interview both employees and people who had gone to the daycare as children. I wanted to get as many different points of view as possible so that it wouldn't seem too terribly biased. Of course, I agreed to not use their real names for the sake of their privacy. The first person I interviewed was a middle-aged woman who looked after the infants at the daycare. For the sake of her privacy, we'll just call her Margaret. What was it like working at the daycare? I asked her. She replied, Oh, it wasn't anything too spectacular, just your typical day of working with children, or babies in my case. 
I see, I told her, before I asked, have you had any problems while working there? Margaret shook her head. With the babies, of course not. They could be fussy, but they weren't any trouble at all. The children were another story. This piqued my interest. Were the children that attended Happy Sun Daycare too much for the employees to handle? Or could it be that there were cases of abuse going on that had been kept secret until now? I had to find out. Why might that be? I asked. Well, Margaret paused for a second as though she was apprehensive about speaking to me. There were times when I heard muffled squealing. No, not squealing. Screaming. At first I thought it was just the children pretending to be scared, but the more I heard it, the more I realized those screams were real, that something was terrifying or possibly even hurting them. Did you ever see any children get hurt? Margaret nodded. Yes. Most of them were just the typical scrapes and bruises you'd expect to find on a child who fell while playing or who bumped his head while trying to show off to his or her friends. Some of them, though, seemed off to me. Every so often I would see a child walk past on the way to the nurse's office, and each time the child looked like he'd been scratched or even bitten. Children scratched or bitten? That would be cause for alarm for anyone. Perhaps some wild animal had decided to make its home near the daycare and curious children had gotten too close. Maybe a stray dog had wandered into the playground and some poor unknowing kid wanted to pet it. Were there any animals in the area? I decided to ask. Stray dogs, raccoons, perhaps a possum's nest? I doubt it. Pets weren't allowed at the daycare, and traps were set up at night to keep any wildlife away. Though there might have been a dog roaming around the area. Margaret shook her head. I pointed out, perhaps it was the dog that had bitten those children. Oh, I only heard the dog, she told me. I had never actually seen it, and all I heard were the occasional growl, snarl, or howl. So Margaret had only heard what sounded like a dog. I couldn't rule out the possibility that perhaps she had mistaken some noise she heard for that of a dog. Maybe she had heard some children that were only pretending to be dogs and mistook them for a real one. Or maybe she had heard the wind and thought it was a howl. If that were the case, that would explain the scratches and bites she saw on some of the children. It wasn't too out of the realm of possibility that a child could have simply scratched his or her arm on a branch or part of the fence by accident. With what sounded like a dog's growl to her, Margaret could have reached the conclusion that the children were being attacked by some sort of stray canine. Still, I had to learn more about the daycare. With the possibility of a cover-up regarding a series of dog attacks, I figured that could potentially shed some light on what Margaret had mentioned. After doing some background checking, I managed to find a young man who went to Happy Sun Daycare when he was around five or six. Let's just call him Scott. I found Scott working at a local butcher shop. I had to wait until his shift was over before I could start the interview. Luckily, it wasn't too long of a wait, and it gave me some time to consider what to ask him. Do you remember anything about Happy Sun Daycare? I asked. I know it was a long time ago for you, but perhaps you can recall something? Scott thought for a moment before replying. Not much. I was only five, maybe six when I went. I can remember just doing what kids do at that age. Play, finger paint, watch cartoons, that kind of stuff. I nodded. Were you a good kid? For the most part, he admitted. Occasionally I'd get into some trouble. Nothing too serious, though. Just your typical kid fussiness. You know, not wanting to take naps, refusing to eat veggies, that sort of thing. I see, I replied as I wrote down what he told me on a notepad. And was the daycare fair in how they disciplined you? Eh, somewhat. All I ever got was a scolding and the occasional time out. Pretty much they made you sit in a corner for a few minutes until they felt you were ready to join the other kids. Though you were lucky if that's all you got, Scott pointed out. What Scott said baffled me a bit. They were lucky? How? I began to wonder if perhaps there had been more severe punishments for the more unruly children that attended the daycare. Could there have been some sort of more controversial form of discipline that the employees at Happy Sun Daycare used 
that they didn't want known to the public. I had to know. What exactly do you mean? For a brief moment, Scott gave a brief shudder. He seemed to have recalled something from his childhood that frightened him and seemed to have affected him in his adulthood as well. The kids who got into real trouble were sent into the gray door. Scott heaved a heavy sigh. I've never been in there myself. I, I knew a few kids that did, ones that would get into fights or throw huge tantrums. They'd end up going into that room. I don't know what happened in there, but they'd always come out shaking with wide eyes. A few would break down crying. Some would scream. One kid even threw up before passing out. I frowned slightly. What sort of horrors had been conducted in the room that had been nicknamed the Grey Door? I then remembered what Margaret had told me and decided to check and see if perhaps there was a connection with her story and what Scott had just said. Did the children have any scratches or bites on them? I asked. Did you hear any strange noises? He nodded. A few kids had scratches on them after they left the Grey Door, but... I thought they got those before and I just didn't notice them at first. They could have tripped or something. I did hear some heavy breathing. That could have just been some kid panting from running a lot. Hard to say for sure. First Margaret said she thought she heard a dog snarling, and now Scott told me he heard heavy breathing. But the strange noises, mysterious scratches or misbehaving children, and the mystery of the gray door room, I couldn't help but wonder what it was that Happy Sun Daycare had been hiding all these years. I thanked Scott for taking the time to speak to me before moving on to the next person to interview. With my curiosity regarding the gray door still heightened, I figured the next person to speak to would be one of the more troublemaking attendees of the daycare. I had to know more about what went on inside that room, and perhaps one of them could tell me. After doing more background checks, I managed to track down a young woman whom we'll refer to as Alice. She'd been arrested two weeks ago for spraying graffiti and was charged for vandalism. Rather than spend time in jail, she agreed to do four months of community service. From what I read about her records, it seemed this wasn't the first time she'd gotten in trouble with the law. Were you always this much trouble? I asked her. Alice shrugged. Maybe. I wasn't sure how easy it would be to get the answers I wanted from her. She seemed like the type who would only cooperate if either she would get some sort of advantage or if it meant less time behind bars. I need to know about Happy Sun Daycare, I pointed out to her. Do you remember anything about the gray door? For a brief second, a hint of fear flashed in her eyes. Her face became pale as a few beads of sweat trickled down her forehead. That was a long time ago, Alice pointed out. I replied, surely you must have remembered something. Records show you were 10 when you attended. Are you sure you can't recall anything? Alice took a few deep breaths and began to regain her composure. If the mere mention of the gray door room was enough to put fear into her after all those years, I couldn't help but dread what horrors she could have possibly experienced. Here was someone who had run-ins with the law, someone who had been arrested for various crimes, primarily theft, vandalism, and trespassing, and yet it was something from her childhood that caused the most fear of being punished. Why? Okay, I'll tell you, but you gotta promise never to say that I told you anything, got it? Alice sighed. I reassured her. I won't reveal any names that will be strictly confidential. You see, I was playing outside in the playground, she began to explain. I remember wanting to play on the swings. Another kid claimed he'd already gotten first dibs to play on them. Before I knew it, we were in a big argument. I lost control. Next thing I knew, he was on the ground crying. I must have pushed him when we were arguing. One of the teachers came up and grabbed me by the arm and dragged me inside. She told me that I would be taken into what the other kids called the gray door room as punishment. What was inside the room? I asked in anticipation. Alice took another deep breath and let out a shudder and a sigh. The room was almost empty. 
I remember the floor was nothing but dirt ground, and the only light was a dingy old bulb that barely lit anything up. The teacher just shoved me in and slammed the door shut. At first, I tried pounding on the door and screaming. I cried out for anyone to let me out. It was so dark, cold, and I was so scared. And I, I heard something. Something was behind me. I turned around and I remember screaming louder than I've ever screamed in my life. I frowned in concern. What did you see? It was a dog, or at least I, I think it was a dog. She choked back a few tears. I didn't get a good look at it since it, it was so dark. All I remember was that it was the biggest and ugliest dog I'd ever seen. That thing had glowing yellow eyes, huge sharp teeth, and was covered in black shaggy fur. And before I knew it, it snarled and lunged at me. I ran as fast as I could, screaming and begging for anyone to come and save me. It grabbed onto my skirt with its teeth and tried to pull me towards it. I tripped and fell, but I managed to kick it in the face a couple times to get it to let go. Then it lunged at me again, but luckily for me, the door finally opened and one of the teachers pulled me out of the room and slammed the door shut before the dog could get me again. So there was a dog after all. The stories were all starting to come together. Margaret's story about hearing screams and growling. Scott's story about horrified kids who'd been sent to the gray door room. And now there was Alice's story about being sent to that room and being attacked by some sort of large, vicious dog. Still, I had to know more. Why did they use a dog? Why did they cover it up? Perhaps the people working at Happy Sun Daycare were afraid that such a punishment would be too extreme to use on children. Or maybe they feared being sued by some animal rights group. I then thanked Alice for her time and set forth to find the next person to talk to. Maybe another one of the employees, if I was lucky. Might be able to get one of them to reveal the truth about what was going on in the gray door room. Once again, I began searching through the records of anyone who ever worked at Happy Sun Daycare. It took some time to find someone who was willing to talk to me. Most former employees I asked were either too busy or simply didn't want to give an interview. A few of them said various profanities as well. I couldn't tell if they were angry that I had learned about what was going on all those years ago or if they were afraid of what might happen if they revealed any more secrets to me. Still, I managed to track down at least one person who was willing to tell me his experiences working at Happy Sun Daycare. Mr. Smith, as we'll call him, worked as a janitor at the daycare back when it was still running. He'd managed to get the job only because his aunt was in charge of one of the head offices there as well. However, Mr. Smith had moved to another town since the daycare closed years ago. This meant I couldn't interview him in person, so we sent each other email instead. Mr. Smith explained that he had some form of narcolepsy since he was a teenager and a history of sleepwalking as well. Doctors couldn't figure out what was causing his condition, but they couldn't find any other adverse health effects linked to it either. This still made it difficult for him to find work, though. He told me that he was grateful that his aunt managed to get him a job at Happy Sun Daycare. I had so many questions, and, well, I wasn't sure which one to ask first. After I got his first response, I wrote back to him. I wanted to know how he was able to hold his job despite his condition. Was he on medication for it? How did the other employees and the children treat him? A couple of days passed before I got any response from him. I quickly opened the latest email response from Mr. Smith and began to read. He replied that his aunt would mix him a special herbal tea for him that would help him keep his narcolepsy in check. She apparently strongly believed in herbal medicine and said that it was better than any standard medicine on the market. Mr. Smith wrote about how the tea was quite bitter and how he hated drinking it, but he had to drink it if he wanted to keep his job. Though, on occasion, his aunt would run out of the leaves needed for the tea and he'd end up falling asleep. This prompted another employee to go and make sure he didn't accidentally hurt himself or others. As for how others treated him, Mr. Smith explained in his letter that the children were generally very nice to him. 
Most of them were quite curious and would ask him a lot of questions while he worked. A few would generally act as a nuisance, but he didn't recall any of them being too much trouble. On the other hand, the other employees seemed to have a sense of uneasiness around him. He explained how he felt they seemed extremely cautious around him. Also, he pointed out that his aunt always kept a close eye on him. He wasn't sure if this was due to his condition or for some other reason, though. That just caused more questions to form in my mind. Why were the other employees uneasy around him? Was it because he was the nephew of one of the higher-ups? Or was there another reason? And there was the matter of his aunt keeping a close eye on him. Maybe they were trying to keep the whole issue regarding the gray door room a secret from him. Perhaps they were afraid that he would find out about the dog and would contact the police. I had to know if he knew anything about the room. I quickly wrote a reply and asked if he knew anything about a large empty room and children being attacked by some sort of large dog. Another couple of days passed before I got another response from Mr. Smith. I opened the reply and began to read. He said that he didn't remember any sort of dog at the daycare. In fact, he pointed out that animals weren't allowed on the property and that he would set traps to keep the squirrels and mice out. His aunt was very strict about no pets being allowed as well, most likely due to any potential allergy his kids might have. Mr. Smith explained in his reply that perhaps that dog that Alice claimed had attacked her was just someone in a cheap-looking dog costume, that the room was kept barely lit so the kids in there wouldn't realize it was a fake, and that the scratches and bites were just the results of them tripping and accidentally scratching themselves on some dirt. To my surprise, he had been in the gray door room himself several times as well. Strangely, he pointed out that they were always when he hadn't had any tea to drink and would wake up in the room. He wasn't sure if anyone had simply moved him there so he could sleep without being in anyone's way or if he'd been sleepwalking again and just stumbled in there by mistake. Mr. Smith explained that the room was originally going to be a large storage closet for various arts and crafts-related supplies, but was never finished due to budget cuts. He wrote in his reply that his aunt didn't want the area to go to waste, so they decided to use it as a means to punish misbehaving children. In his opinion, someone probably bought a dog costume and would wear it while terrorizing any children sent into the room as a means of instilling fear of punishment into their minds. I sent one last email to Mr. Smith, thanking him for taking the time to reply to my messages. The whole thing about Happy Sun Daycare was starting to piece together. From what I had gathered via the various interviews from both students and employees, children who misbehaved were sent to a large, empty space called the Gray Door Room, that there was a dog or possibly just someone in a dog costume that would chase any child sent in there. And finally, that child would be pulled to safety before the dog could cause any serious harm. There was only one thing left to do. I was going to head inside Happy Sun Daycare and investigate the infamous Gray Door Room for myself. I had to see for myself if there was anything that could solve this strange cover-up. Several minutes passed as I drove out into the countryside and towards the abandoned building. I parked the car in the front driveway and took a few deep breaths. The front door was unlocked, which was lucky for me. I gently pushed the door open and began to look inside. The interior was dingy and covered in a layer of dust. Cobwebs spread over various desks and chairs that hadn't been used in quite some time. A musty smell filled the house and mixed with the odor of feces and urine from the rats that now made the place their home. It was nauseating, to say the least. After I explored several different areas, I soon found the foreboding gray door that was said to lead to the dreaded room. The door was quite heavy, and it took me several tries before I managed to force it open. Just like how Alice had described, the room was dark and empty, with a dirt floor and a dingy bulb. Said bulb had burned out long ago, so I used an old desk to prop the door open in order to see anything. I could see faint bloodstains on the ground and on the wall, 
but I couldn't tell who or what the blood belonged to. There were also strange markings on the wall as well. I took a closer look and could have sworn they resembled claw marks of some sort. As I continued to examine the room, I noticed various footprints in the dirt. Many were faded or had been trampled over one another, but I could still make out a few. Most of them were the footprints of children. They looked like the children had been running away from something. There was one other distinct set of footprints that caught my attention. I examined them closely. I could definitely make out the distinctive foot pads, claws, and individual toes on at least one of the prints. This wasn't some person in a cheap costume. Happy Sun Daycare had been using a dog to terrorize children. I had to let people know what they had been hiding all those years. However, as I made my way out the daycare and to my car, there was one aspect about those footprints that made me uneasy. Since when do dogs walk on two legs? Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. All stories in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find source links or links to the authors in the show notes. Resident Spirit Giving Me a Heads Up was posted by Spirit Waiting at YourGhostStories.com. Who Killed Jake Lingle was written by Troy Taylor. Blood on the Kitchen Floor was written by Gary Sweeney for the lineup. Emails from the Dead was written by Les Hewitt for Paranorms.com. Pregnancy and the Paranormal was posted at GhostsAndGhouls.com. Our Dreams Glimpses of a Parallel Universe was posted at MessageToEagle.com. And the original creepypasta, Happy Sun Daycare, was written by Chelsea Adams. Again, you can find links to these stories in the show notes. Weird Darkness is a production and trademark of Marlar House Productions. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9. As it is written, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love Him. And a final thought from G.K. Chesterton. There are two ways to get enough. One is to continue to accumulate more and more. The other is to desire less. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. <laughs>